Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. It says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Pause. What did Jesus say not to do? What do we do? Let me help you here. Got to be careful what we say and what we do. I'm going to jump off topic real quick because I just want you to think something, but it's going to line back up. Don't be so quick to say stuff like, how can a man tell you what to do with your body? It's your body. And I agree. But this is the thought that I have. A man should not be willing to tell a woman what to do with her body. If she don't listen to Jesus, why would she listen to a man? And that ain't nothing you should be proud of. Men, that's nothing we should be proud of. But ladies, that's, not, that's nothing to brag about. If I won't listen to God in regards to what to do with my body, what makes a man think he can tell me what to do? Because that's essentially what you're saying. You got to be careful. I was going to say that before anybody forgot. Now somebody's mad. You'll be okay. Matthew chapter, it says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Then it says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So in so many words, it's saying do not be so worried and stressed out about storing up stuff that are materialistic. But rather, store up for yourself treasures in heaven, can you actually see heaven physically? You can't. But it's talking about store up things of the spirit because nobody can steal what's up here. Nobody can steal your joy. Nobody can steal your peace. Nobody can steal your patience. Nobody can steal uh, your kindness, your gentleness. Now, they can, you think you have is actually darkness. How deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. So you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. But what do we find ourselves chasing? What destroys our day when we don't have it? What makes us worry? Too much of it makes some people worry because you got to worry about somebody going to try to get you or not. We, we miss church for. Miss our kids' functions for. People get divorced for. When the word of God just clearly said, you cannot serve God and 
We don't like that. I ain't see it. It's in the book. Then verse 25, he says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food? Your body more than clothing. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest, or store food in the barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you much, excuse me, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And you worry about your clothing. Why you worry, he said, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of, lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as, as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Don't they dominate our thoughts too? So what does that make us? Oh, don't, don't get shy now. According to the word, what does it say? But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Could we worry about what we're not getting because we're not living righteously? Or is our appetite so big for things toward what God is offering us isn't enough? Because it ain't like what somebody else got. See, when we are kingdom citizens, what does it mean? What makes a, yeah, that's a good question. What, what makes a king a king? Keep trying. What'd you say? What? Ownership. Ownership. Kings became kings because they owned a piece of land. Literally owned a piece of land. When you owned a piece of land, you were responsible for that land i.e., this is where you get the word land lord. When you owned a piece of land, you could allow whoever to come on your land and plant or sow or build whatever they want on the land, but it's still your land, so they owe you for being on your land. What's your boy name that just messed, that just, just messed, messed the McDonald's people up? His name was Ray. You got McDonald's all over the world. That restaurant started as a family business. Two guys with the last name McDonald, their brother, they made burgers. They only had two of them. But somebody came in and saw how good their product was, and they did not want to franchise it. And they did a bad deal with this guy. Now, this is a true story. They did a bad handshake deal with this guy. And what he did is he got ownership of the name, but he never owned a McDonald's. He went and bought the land. And people put McDonald's on the land. 
and they lost the rights to their very own name. And every McDonald's you see in the world, the McDonald family don't get a dime from it. But the one that owns the land, that's what makes them a king. And the one that owns the land is responsible for everything in the land that they own. So if you got a bunch of businesses on your land, you collecting from every business on your land. So you want those businesses to look good. You want them to be profitable. Why? Because they are on your land and you're responsible for the upkeep of the land. Y'all better hear me here. We own this corner. We're responsible for the upkeep of what's happening on this corner. If we wanted to, we could lease out the rest of this corner and collect forever. But we will be responsible for everything that happens on this corner. We're responsible for the plumbing. We'd be responsible for the lighting. We'd be responsible for the painting. We'd be responsible for everything on there, but we will collect on it. Why? Because we own the land. And when something is messed up, when something is broke, when something is just all kind of jacked up, the tenants, who are they going to go to? The landowner. Because they recognize it's not my responsibility. This belongs to the king. <laughs> Y'all not hearing me here. They will show up to work every day happily, especially when they have a landowner that's going to make sure they lights on, that's going to make sure that the, the grass is cut, that's going to make sure that all of the keys work, that's going to make sure everything is everything. So when we say we are kingdom citizens, I'm going to tell you why we worry. Let me show you. We worry because we were not born into the kingdom. Whatever country you're born in, you're a citizen of that country. Am I making sense? Which means in order for you to become a citizen of another country, you have to relinquish your citizenship somewhere else and to become a citizen of another country. And so what happens if you leave here and decide to become a citizen in, in Jamaica they're going to know you're not from Jamaica because your accent don't sound like Jamaican. They're going to know you're from the United States because of the way you talk, because of the way you dress, because of the way you act, because of the privilege that you think you got. They're going to know you're not from there. Am I making sense? But watch this. In order to become a citizen to the United States, if you come from anywhere else, you have to denounce where your original citizenship is. Now, watch this. You may have been a citizen over in wherever you're from. That doesn't mean when you come to America that you forget where you came from. You still got some of the same ways. You still got some of the same actions. You still got some of the same other things that you have to work through because you're not used to having citizenship here. When Jesus told Peter, you must be born again, he was saying, look, you were born in this world. 
and you have the citizenship of this world. But when you are born again, you will receive the spirit of adoption. In other words, you are going to be adopted into the kingdom, so therefore you have to learn how to act like a kingdom citizen. Adoption. Add. Option. Meaning it was optional for him to add us. We've said this before. Adopted children are probably the most loved because somebody actually wanted them. (laughs) From day one, they were chosen. They were not born into it, but they were adopted into it. And if they're adopted into it, there is something that they have to do. They have to learn how things are done at a certain place, at a certain time. And if they've been in, thank you, Holy Ghost, if they've been in the system long enough, it's hard for them to understand when somebody's just trying to truly love them because their guard is going to be up based off of their circumstances based off of what they've been through in the past, based off of people walking away and leaving them. But someone that was born in it, they don't have those thoughts, they don't have those worries, and to them it's just, this is just normal, this is just natural. But someone that has experienced something outside of it, they bring all of the baggage, all of the weight and everything else inside. See, this is our thing. We've experienced so many things outside of the kingdom of heaven to where we say we are kingdom citizens, but we still act like we're from out there. We worry about money. We worry about people. We worry about reputation. We worry, 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 worry. But then we still say we are kingdom citizens. It don't, it don't add up. God gave us vision, ideas. Purpose, and and let me help you here. Everybody's purpose is not to stand in front of people and speak. If your gift, what God has given you, is drawing a picture and painting, he says, take that gift And glorify me by doing the best that you can with it. But we so busy want our gift to look like somebody else's. To where we devalue our gift because we don't think our gift is going to make us money. Too many of us are looking for our purpose in our occupation. You're looking for your purpose in your job. And sometimes your job is just that. It's a job. Dr. Miles Monroe said it like this, and he said it beautifully. He says, your job is just a classroom to teach you how to walk in your purpose. What do you do naturally that to everybody else is difficult, but to you, you devalue it because it's so simple? I'm not talking about what you've been trained to do because you went to school. I'm talking about what do you do 
that's just in your nature to do, that you just do. And that you don't think it's anything because it's just so natural for you to do. And I'm not talking about something somebody else done told you you good at. thinking and I, and I don't want to hear I'm a good listener because sometimes being a good listener you're a dumping ground because what good does it do to be a good listener if you don't have the answers that somebody need? That's a trick if all I'm doing is listening. And before I know it, I got weight on me. I don't even know where it came from. Well, you just, li you just listen to everybody. If you're going to be a good listener, that means there has to be some wisdom in there in order to help navigate through an issue. Even if that's pointing them in a different direction on how to find, well, how you, you gather information. Am I making sense? Because somebody was thinking that. They think, you know, no, that ain't, that ain't, no, no, that ain't a gift. Sometimes that's just nosy. <laughs> Girl, talk to me, talk to me about anything. You know, I listen. You for real? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Learn to discern the difference. I just think that's just maternal and paternal, just being good people. From a gift aspect, I don't really think that's a gift. I think that's in the will of God. If you are a child of God, you know, the Bible talks bad about men that don't take care of their kids. It said you are worse than an infidel. In other words, that's the expectation. You're supposed to do that. As a kingdom citizen, that's the least you can do is be good to your children. Right now, I don't want to discredit it, but we don't. You have some people that are, I wouldn't say good parents, but they have a true maternal gift be outside of their kids. See, I think it's, yeah, your kids, you're supposed to do that. But when your maternal gift is beyond, then that's different. And then here it is a lot of, oh, whew. A lot of women that have that gift in some areas, they're unable to carry children because their maternal gift brings other children to them that lack. And as unfair as it may seem, the Bible speaks on women being blessed who were unable, women that are unable to carry children, blessed are you for you will be the mother of many. You see, the, the word doesn't shortchange, but see what happens is, is we, what society tells us and what we want sometimes supersede what God has called us to be and we curse who we are because we're not what we think we should be. And we look down on what God created us to be because it's not like somebody else. Or it doesn't meet the desires of what we want. And God says, before I formed you, 
I already knew you. You still trying to get to know the you that I already know. And you got to think about that. From a pastoral standpoint, that is a hard word to have to give to somebody. But when you validate it with the word of God, you open people's hearts up to say, the, word, the will of God, didn't, we didn't have a say-so in why we were created. We know what we wanted, but we know why he, he knows why he created us. And then what we do is we surrender our will for his. I saw a hand. Is it Terry? Let me see. What's up? A gift to me, a gift and a talent are two different things. Two totally different things. People think because they can they can sing or they can play an instrument, they're gifted. Not necessarily. You can go learn how to do that. You can find a thousand other people that can do the same thing. But the gift with somebody that is musically inclined, somebody that is musically inclined that that are gifted, they they do things that are abnormal. They have a certain level of anointing that draws and that pulls. They learn stuff a lot faster. They learn stuff a lot. See, even the school system know there's a difference between gifted and talented. But for some reason, the kingdom don't seem to know that there's a difference between being anointed and being talented. Right? A gift is, your gift is unmatched. Your gift, whatever that gift may be. Some people have a gift of administration. That means they are great with numbers. They are great with, with paperwork. They are great with organization. See, it could be one of it could be so many different things where you can be gifted at for the glory of God. Something that you were not, tr- you know, trained uh, on the foundation to do, but you just can do it now. You can know what your gift is, and then go and receive further training in your gift in order to ex- explore it. But your gift is something nobody can take away from you. And I think sometimes. Some of our gifts are not exposed to a later age. And I believe sometimes we overlook them because it's not as obvious and loud as what other people's may be.